Well, I guess we can uh, get started. Now, my talk is entitled, Beware Your Inner Fundamentalist. Now, I want to first give a little bit of history about the term. The term fundamentalism was actually uh, coined in the United States and was a reference to a particular brand of fundamentalist Christians. It started in the late 1800s into the early 1900s when there was a lot of critical analysis of the Bible and these ultra-conservatives didn't like it. So a group of them got together at, an org at a, group, uh, a Bible college called the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. And they started to put together a group of books of 90 essays promoting the views of what they called the fundamentals of the faith. And the, ter they, the, the people who ascribed to these beliefs started to refer to themselves as fundamentalists. Well, with that fundamentalism, there was not just a belief system that they held, but there was an attitude that they held toward the world, about themselves, and about others. And in our culture, the term fundamentalist began, uh, began to be applied to people exhibiting the same type of social attitudes or belief systems, not necessarily the theology, but the attitude and the way they behaved, so that you ultimately end up with things like people referring to Muslim, uh, Islamic fundamentalists, for instance. That's a complete adoption from Christianity. Fundamentalism was a Christian term describing these people. Uh, they tended to be very aggressive. They tended to be very intolerant. And I want to discuss what I see as the basic traits of these fundamentalists, what their psychology is, how they treat others. Because as I pointed out already, it could be applied to Muslims. It can be applied to any belief system. Fundamentalism in this sense is a personality type. It does not necessarily describe an individual's belief system as much as how they uh, communicate their beliefs, how they hold their beliefs, how they view the world, how they view others. I think that the fundamental or the primary characteristic of the fundamentalists is that they see a, a deep need to force reality to fit their ideology rather than adjust their belief to fit reality. That is, they hold a belief system so strongly that they believe it to be impervious to facts. If facts are brought to their attention which are contrary to their belief system, they dismiss the facts immediately. There's a reason that they're incapable of considering those facts as having any legitimacy. So, it's the way, it's the reason you see fundamentalist Christians who are anti evolution incapable of looking at the facts of evolution, looking at the evidence for it. They will continue to insist that there's no evidence at all for a scientific basis of evolution and that there has to be intelligent design or creationism. Now, the fundamentalist, because he operates on a basis of certain moral principles that he's adopted and which he then applies to everything in the world, he believes that those moral principles gives him not just permission but requires him to speak out on every single issue that there is. Uh, even when they are asked about issues on which they know nothing about it, they will have an opinion. It could be a brand new topic to them, and you can ask them about it, and you will get a response. Now, one of the responses libertarians tend to give when they move into this mode is, oh, the market will take care of it. Well, you know, that's, it's a pat answer. It's a cliche. It is not saying, tell me more. What is your information? What is your evidence? What are the facts about this case? And let me think about how this would apply. It's an automatic response that thinks you already know how to answer a person because you hold certain moral principles in your head. 
Now, I think there are, there are multiple principles within libertarianism that work together. And when you know the facts, you know better which principles apply and which principles don't apply in those individual cases. I think a lot of libertarians are so strong on principles that they, in fact, think they don't need facts. And I, I want to discuss for a second here, what, are the, what is the relationship between principles and facts? Principles tell us, in a sense, the general direction in which we want to travel. So if you were looking at this as a journey, principles would be like a compass that tells you which way is north, which way is east. You know the general direction you want to go in. But facts are like road maps. They tell you which specific routes you have to take to get from where you are to where you want to go. Now, some uh, libertarians of a more fundamentalist bent would make the argument, you go, you know, we're going east, we go east. Well, wait a minute, no, the road goes north. No, we don't go north. North is wrong. We want to go east. No, there's a mountain in the way. We want to go east. East is the direction we go. That's the sort of mentality they would have where they're not looking at the facts which say, how do we get from where we're at to where we want to be? The road map sometimes takes us in directions that we don't want to go because those are the options that are open to us. Facts tell us what options are open. Facts tell us which alternatives we can pick from. And with that, and combining them with principles, we can use them to most effectively head in the direction that we want to uh, go, as opposed to getting stuck outside a river where there's no bridge and having no way to cross it and standing there saying, but we have to go that way. Often there are imposed conditions from the outside world which prevent us from applying principles consistently. We are often, as libertarians, in the modern society, put in positions where we are not given a principled choice. Where we look and, and the state says you, I mean, for instance, I would assume if you're a hardcore anarchist, you want privatized roads, but the state really did force you to travel on public roads to get here. Now, you could take a print, you, you know, you could say you're taking an ultra principled view and refuse to do that. And if you had done that, you would still be uh, probably in a cave off in the middle of nowhere because you wouldn't have actually be able to use cities either. So we're forced to make alternatives or make choices that we don't want to take. I think that one of the uh, important things for us to remember in life is we do not get perfect choices all the time. In fact, we don't get perfect choices most of the time. We are faced throughout life with a series of imperfect choices. And one of the things that uh, free market economists have noted is that every time you make a choice, there is a trade-off. There is always a trade-off. If you take one thing, you give up something else. You're trading something for something. The idea that there is a perfect choice, which has no costs whatsoever, is a fantasy. It's always choices, and there are always uh, costs associated with them, and none of the choices are perfect. Uh, we liberty, I mean, consider if you're a parent, you may or may not want to send your children to government school. You may want them to have schooling. You may not be able to afford to send them to private schooling because you're already pub paying for public schooling. It's an imperfect choice. You've paid into a retirement system. If you are reach the stage where it comes for retirement and it's there to pay you back some of the money you paid in, some libertarians would say, oh, you shouldn't take it, but you've paid into it. It's not a perfect choice. You were forced to fund the system, so is it wrong for you to then take from out of the system? Uh, we are always faced with these imperfect choices, 
And unfortunately, the one choice that never crops up in this is utopia, a perfect choice. The absolute one where there's no costs and no obvious drawbacks uh, in terms of our principles. A fundamentalist also assumes that his belief system answers all questions. Now, the, you, you'd see this certainly with the Christians. You can ask them about anything, and their sort of view will be, well, the Bible will tell you what it says. And I've heard some who say, the Bible answers every important question, and if it's not in the Bible, then it's not important. So they, they have a way of dismissing all of the questions there. I don't think any belief system has all the answers. And I'm not even sure that every question we ask has an answer. I think we're very good at asking questions, sometimes questions for which I do not believe answers will be possible. They're certainly not possible now, and they may never be possible. Uh, the next thing the fundamentalist does is he begins with moral condemnations. In a debate with a fundamentalist, they very quickly resort to denouncing opponents as immoral or evil. For them, there is no such thing as a sincere opponent. There is never a difference of facts. There is never a difference of interpretation. It comes down to the fundamentalists that if you disagree with them, it means you are either evil or stupid. And those are the two choices that you've got. Now, if you view others, inher anyone who disagrees with you as inherently stupid or evil, this causes certain problems in communication with them. First, it gives you a tendency to argue that any misfortunes that your opponents suffer are deserved by them, and as Christians would put it, the wages of sin. So it destroys a certain amount of benevolency towards other human beings because they oppose you, they are evil, therefore when bad things happen to them, it's justice. So the fundamentalist tends to relish the misfortunes of others. Fundamentalists often wish to isolate themselves from everyone else because, of course, these people are sinful, they're evil, they're stupid. So they will cut off friends, they will cut off family. They only want to associate with those who are members of the saints if you want to use a religious term for it. So there are the sinners out there, there are the saints that are in here. And you're automatically in trouble when you hear somebody tell you that if your friends or your family don't agree with your viewpoints, cut them off. When you hear that, run for the door. That's a fundamentalist attitude, an inherently occultic attitude. The more cultic groups in religion take exactly that attitude. Isolate yourself from anyone who doesn't agree with you. Uh, for the fundamentalists, the sole purpose of a relationship with a sinner is to convert them to the truth. They have difficulty in relating to individuals as individuals and they only see them as being either in agreement with their beliefs or not in agreement with their beliefs. If they are in agreement with their beliefs, then they are worthy of your fellowship and friendship. If they are not in agreement, then the only purpose you have to interact with them is to convert them. So you have no ability to connect with people on other levels. Uh, one of the problems, of course, with that is that it encourages people within those movements who have no social skills. It encourages a set of attitudes that makes it more difficult for them to communicate with people who are not like them. They, are, they 
relish meetings where they can all talk to each other because they have very little capability to talk to others. So out of this, of course, it means they tend to be very bad at changing minds. Their attitudes towards others is an aggressive one. Their attitude is to see others as evil and the enemy. Their attitude is you're on, the only fit object to have you uh, that you present to us is to convert you. And we have no belief that uh, any of your beliefs could possibly be sincere. Uh, if you don't think somebody else is sincere, if you only think they're evil or stupid, it makes it difficult for you to have dialogue with them. All you can do to them is preach at them. You can't talk with them. Fundamentalists then tend to ignore new facts as they come along and just repeat the same old ones over and over. There was something that was said in uh, Man of La Mancha where Don Quixote says facts are the enemy of truth. Now it's an interesting statement because one would think facts and truth are the same thing. The definition of truth that I use is truth is that which corresponds with reality. And that would in a sense be a fact. But what he means here is something greater. When he speaks of truth, it's the way Christians talk about the truth. Or some people say they have the solution. It's a overall system that they've created, a belief system, which they put on such a superior status that facts which don't fit into it yet or may not fit into it ever, because I, as again, as I say, there may be no such thing as a perfect belief system, that those facts are the enemy. They're wrong. They have to be wrong. So you will get libertarians who, if they're presented with a fact that doesn't seem to fit into our system of beliefs, their first thing to do is to deny the facts have any validity. It can't be true because it doesn't fit into the truth. Facts become the enemy. Fundamentalism tend to drive people away, as you might imagine. They have no ability to dialogue. They preach. They make it appear that anyone they're talking to either has to surrender completely to the new philosophy or give your heart to Jesus or you still remain damned and a sinner. There's an, there's an all or nothing attitude with the fundamentalist. So if, if you move into a libertarian circle and we talk about libertarian fundamentalists and you adopt say 70% of the views, I can assure you there are plenty of people who will be happy to harangue you tell you how evil and stupid you are for not adopting the other 30%, and who will tell you that you are not a real libertarian. You can't be a real libertarian, because the real libertarian is the person who agrees with me 100% of the time. And each fundamentalist libertarian, interestingly, becomes then the measuring stick by which all other libertarians are measured. You live up to my expectations or standards, or you're wrong, you're a sinner, you're stupid. This tends to discourage evolution of thought. It requires, in a sense, virgin births. You know, there's suddenly, boom, a miracle. And you've moved from this position to this position instantaneously because everything in between is immoral and evil. This is one of the things where people say, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, they allow the perfect, their vision of what a perfect libertarian is, to be an en the enemy of the good. All these other good libertarians are cast into outer darkness where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. They are supposed to suffer eternal damnation and 
if God doesn't inflict it upon them, the fundamentalists is quite willing to do so in this world. But I think evolution in thought is a requirement constantly. I believe that every libertarian ought to be constantly questioning their own beliefs. If you think you doubt, if you don't doubt, you're not thinking. I am not saying that doubt in itself is, is the goal you're seeking. Doubting is a process that helps you reach goals. It helps you refine ideas, to rethink issues, to accumulate new facts and add them into it and make better ideas. Now, as I said, I thought you, we, we face imperfect choices. And all of life is a system of imperfect choices. Well, what we do as we go through life is we look at those imperfect choices and we try to keep picking better ones. Look at it as an evolution, not a destination. And figure out that the new facts are going to help you pick the new better choices. That's why new facts should not be shunned, but embraced, considered, debated, discussed. I personally believe that every aspect and principle of libertarianism ought to be open to debate. And that libertarians should constantly ask themselves, are my fundamental premises right? Are there situations where they might be wrong? What facts tell me that there might be a problem here? Instead of ignoring flaws, look at the flaws. Consider the flaws. Ask yourself, is there a better way of formulating it? Or is there a better way of thinking about it? Don't immediately assume that if it doesn't fit the conclusions you've already held, it must be immoral, it must be evil. Embrace it, look at it, reconsider it. Fundamentalists tend to scare people away. And the people that they don't scare away scare me. Because the people who they attract are people who do not think, who are not willing to consider facts and evidence. They are people who are looking, in a sense, for a very simplistic answer, a ready-made answer. They are looking for a system that tells them how to deal with the world without considering the complexities of the world. That's what the fundamentalist Christians do, and I would argue fundamentalist libertarians can do the exact same thing. Give people a simplistic system that doesn't require them to grasp or grapple with the hard questions in life. And I was thinking of something last night on what, what else, what other traits might these converts that these people would attract have. Now, if you denounce someone and tell them, you're, if you disagree with me, you're evil or you're stupid, and they find that a sufficient argument to change their mind, what does that tell you about this person? Well, one thing is I figured they're a psychological basket case. Because this is not a person who has any, any amount of self-esteem, uh, self healthy self-esteem. People who have self-esteem, who feel confident in their own abilities, are able and willing to consider facts. And they are able and willing to change their minds based on facts. But if what they've changed their mind on is a moralistic harangue that you're an evil sinner who's going to be doomed in hell, and if you don't give your heart to Murray Rothbard, you're going to burn forever. If that's all it takes for these individuals to convert, you are then attracting to the, movie, to the movement individuals who do not have healthy self-esteem, 
who do not have self-confidence, and who are in essence looking for an authoritarian system that gives them answers to every question that they might ask. And in that system, if they don't have the answer, they know somebody does. And I'm saying sometimes there's no damn answer. Sometimes it's just not there. Life is a lot messier than fundamentalist minds are able to understand. Another problem here is that if you see everyone you're talking to is either stupid or evil, and you fail to convince them to change their mind, whose fault is it? Well, it's their fault. You know it automatically because they're stupid and evil. It's never your fault. It means that these individuals have difficulty being introspective and looking at how they're dealing with other people. And they're incapable of saying, is it me? Am I driving people away from the ideas that I claim to embrace? They can't consider that position. They can only see it as a problem with the person to whom they're communicating. That again makes it very difficult for them to be good persuaders. And in fact, I want to clearly say that there's what I call a libertarian theory, a labor theory of value. Um, we heard a little bit of that from someone who said, I don't care what you do, just do something. No. Not all labor has value. That's one of the basic principles of Austrian economics. Value, labor only has value if it produces things that people want. Now, some libertarians have negative value. The more labor they engage in, the more people they drive away. There are other libertarians, the more they work, the more people they attract to libertarianism. So for some people, the most productive thing they can do is to do nothing. Because at least they're not out there destroying value. But of course you can never, if you've got the view, it's us, the moral few, them, the evil many, if you've got that view, then there is no such thing as labor that doesn't, doesn't matter because it's never you, it's always them, so whatever you do counts for something because it's, it's in a sense, a holy crusade. Uh, one of the interesting things I've seen in some of the fundamentalist libertarians is they only measure their effectiveness on the basis of what they see and not what they don't see. Again, let's go to Bastiat talked about the importance of what is seen and what is not seen. That sometimes in situations you see what something produces but you don't see what it takes away. This is what these libertarians will do. They will go out there and spend their lifetime trying to create converts to libertarian ideas. And they will drive away numerous people who are interested in those ideas, but who find their, stylist, their style of uh, dealing with people, their denunciations, so unpleasant that they shun the ideas that they're interested in. The fundamentalist gets his convert here and maybe another one over there. And for him, this proves effectiveness because all he's looking at are the couple of successes and he never sees the string of failures that follow him. But there's another problem to this and that is the people he tends to convert tend to be people who are like him, not like all those other people who he uh, chased away. So in many ways, the more successful he is, the more damage he does. Because he's just creating more people who are going to drive away more people than they attract. I think sometimes that libertarianism could be a lot more widespread if it weren't for libertarians trying to spread the message of libertarianism. <laughs> I think there's a natural tendency in a lot of people toward a libertarian basic sense of morality. 
Now, we want to uh, get them to understand that sense of morality, but we're not going to do it by haranguing them. There was something I read last night. Uh, I'd advise if you have a chance to go to Huffington Post. There's a piece Michael Shermer wrote uh, on Atlas Shrugged 2. And it was subtitled, I think, something like, uh, Why Ayn Rand Just Won't Go Away. And he talks about some of the studies that are done on the differences in political belief systems that people hold. And he brought up a concept which I had not heard described this way before, called the righteous mind. And as I read it, I realized that what this scholar, uh, Jonathan Haidt, describes as the righteous mind is what I've been seeing along as the fundamentalist mindset, the way the fundamentalist views. The righteous mind, according to Haidt, is somebody who looks at others not just as wrong, but righteously wrong. That there are no errors of fact, there are errors of intent. That if you get it wrong, it's because you intend to get it wrong and that you're evil. Now, they argue that that mindset in, the, in, in our species sort of evolved because it was very effective at forming cohesive small collectives, tribes, villages, even nations in a sense, where people give a self-identity, a moral self-identity that puts them superior to the surrounding peoples around them, makes them all evil, gives us social co cohesion. Now, the problem, of course, with this righteous mind is that to the degree that it works in giving the in-group social cohesion, it alienates them from the outgroup. Now, if all you are doing is going to war with these people, maybe, you know, it's not so bad. But libertarianism isn't supposed to be at war with the world. Libertarians are supposed to be out there talking to the world, engaging with the people, and trying to show them what we think are better solutions to the solutions that they're using now. But the moment you've got this mindset that we are the pure good few and they are the evil many, we're now at war with those individuals. This cohesiveness, which helps hold the group together, also makes it very difficult for us to reach outside the group to talk to others and to bring the others into uh, not the group. This is the thing. It's not the group. What we're supposed to understand, it's not the collective, it's the ideas. We're, we're not trying to set up isolated, conforming communities. Okay, I know some people want to do that. Um, that's another sign, you know. The moment I, I hear somebody say they want to head for the hills and set up their own little community and isolate themselves from everyone else, I'm just waiting for them to get into a Jim Jones or shootout, or not Jim Jones, who's the other one? Waco. David Koresh. David Koresh. I can never remember my cult leaders. I have enough trouble keeping track of our own cult leaders. <laughs> so we don't want to create these, commu these, these isolated communities. Uh, the best things that a libertarian can do is probably the opposite of what they do, which is make most of their friends non-libertarians. Uh, one of the problems I've seen in libertarianism is that a person becomes a libertarian and then they make lots of libertarian friends and all their other friends sort of get isolated and pushed to the side. The libertarian has a tendency then to start to socially isolate themselves. This is exactly the same thing which various religious groups do as well. Somebody gets converted to Mormonism, they have a tendency to start making all their friends be Mormons. Non-Mormons start to get pushed out of their lives, and they start to isolate themselves from people. 
what we're trying to do is something entirely different. We're not trying to set up a community of saints. We're trying to change the way people deal with one another to a peaceful, voluntary, cooperative system. So, in a sense, we're faced with a difficulty of that the beliefs that make us more cohesive as a group make it harder for us to attract other people to the ideas. And that's a tension within libertarianism, a psychological tension that I think we ought to be aware of and that we need to become or reappraise how we deal with others as libertarians. Any questions? Angela? You're, you're a rational guy, conservative, so you're anti-war. Um, the anti-war movement uh, has been mentioned for many reasons, but one of which is like, in the leftist but part of the libertarian movement has its own particular responsibility is in the development of not questioning, the, not, not discussing whether it's inappropriate to question the, the, the story of 9-11, but those people who identify as 9-11 fundamentalist attitude towards those who observe observers of the history as opposed to Yes. Uh, I th okay, I think fundamentally the 9-11 truthers are irrational. I think conspiracy theories are irrational. I think conspiracy theories play the role for people who don't understand history that God plays for the role of people who don't understand evolution. Um, it's a substitute and an easy answer. The problem, of course, is that those simplistic answers can attract a narrow band of individuals who are just naturally inclined to looking for easy answers and end up tur turning away a lot of people. Um, the truthers alienate more people than they attract. And uh, I, would, I honestly put them in the same camp that I say about those who have negative value to their labor. There, that it is better for the libertarians to just avoid them as much as possible and get their message out separate from that. Uh, it, I mean, the difficulty here is that while I'm saying we need to try to think about all these things and contemplate new facts, there are just some things that are destructive within the movement and it's best for us as individuals not to associate with it. So I, there are lots of people I just, because I think they're very negative value, um, I don't, I'll just say, look, I'll go do my thing. I don't want to, you know, you go do your thing, that's fine. I'm not going to go on your stage and I'm not going to give you a form because I think you've got a, a negative value, but I don't know, there's not a whole lot else we can do with it. It isn't, we, we don't, it's not like there's a hierarchy. It's, it's free and open. So, um, you said that one of the, of the things that we should always do is to keep an open mind and you'll constantly pull their leaves open to revision. But I see it's like the problem of being excessive to that degree is that, you know, you get to a point where it's just like, oh, we will agree to disagree or, you know, yeah, I'm not willing to to apply any, you know, moral condemnation, even the worst uh, cases. So you can say, like, you know, this, um, the, I oppose the war in Iraq, but I support all the soldiers, or something like that, where you apply your um, your beliefs to some abstract and be unwilling to put it into concrete. To, to say that most people have problems, it's problems of facts, not problems of intent, doesn't mean that all people have don't have problems of intent, that there are some people who do evil things. And wisdom is trying to figure out where that border is. You have to make that decision. And yes, I think it is fine to, I mean, I would not share a podium with somebody who, no matter how pure they espouse their libertarianism, 
who says they hate Jews or hate blacks or hates gays. I won't share a podium with them, period. I just won't do it. I think, the, the, you know, maybe there's bad facts there, but maybe they're evil. But, I, you know, we have to make that choice. I basically agree with you. A lot of people say it makes sense, but I wish to become the advocate for a moment <coughs> while people be stupid. Mm -hmm. It is Christian principle, thou shalt not judge, and though the majority of Christian, my experience, do not follow it, how they justify it, their problem. On the other hand, there is Ayn Rand's principle, which is quite the opposite of her essay. How a rational person should live in a rational world. She said, "Judge, judge everybody. Have fully verbalized judgment of everybody you know. If you pay to judge yourself, you might be principle is undefined. Thou should not judge. Judge, but with uh, not in a rush. Not before you consider all parts. Not before you consider the possible mitigations. Now, with that in mind." There are people whom I would still judge as stupid. Yes. Uh, and I'll give you an example. And then I know passionately anti war. There is anti war of home day. There is with everything there. We could vote for Obama and was trying to convince me to do the same. <laughs> now, this is not the evil. This is complete disregard of the most elementary rules of logic. Okay, but I th what you may be dealing with here, and this is, but if, if there's any consolation that I get out of uh, when I look at fundamentalists within libertarianism, is that I realize that conservatives have fundamentalists, socialists have fundamentalists, progressives have fundamentalists. Every belief system can have a fundamentalist mentality to it, and they have they deal with their own fundamentalist wings as well. So, you will get somebody who, if they're a fundamentalist leftist, they will read the things that libertarians say that agree with them and never challenge any of the facts where they disagree with them. And they are still going to put their world into that black or white fundamentalist view. So, what you're just really dealing with here is somebody who is, I don't think he's stupid, otherwise he wouldn't be reading all that stuff. I think he's a, yeah, but I think he's, he's a fundamentalist in the sense of unopened to facts that do not fit his already existing belief system. He's not evil or stupid, but the, some strong evil that would justify his actions. Yes, that's, that's fundamentalism. One last question, I guess. Um, yeah, so I guess, uh, I agree with a lot of what you said, but some some of the stuff that uh, I guess you probably I fall under the fundamentalist camp, and I think uh, and I've been uh, doing libertarian things since I was 13, and I've kind of moved in that direction, away from KO and uh, the more the more big ten approach, and I find now more value in the people who are radical and uncompromising, and that sort of the direction. And it touches on what you're talking about, in group and out group, uh, and sort of what, what his critique was, which is if uh, if you're, you're creating this big ten, it's going to be seventy percent, well, you know, the thirty percent in favor of violence then uh, you sort of end up on this slippery slope. And to use your compass well, analogy, if you're headed east, there's a lot of people out there that will try to manipulate the map and say, oh, well, yeah, you want to go east, but you know, we should go north for a while, oh, a little bit longer. Little I bit longer. didn't say this is easy. In fact, I said it's not. Your way is easy, because you don't have to actually make those choices and say, wait a minute, is, the, is somebody really just manipulating things here or is there a real genuine obstacle? What do I have to face here? What are my choices? It just seems like the risk, I, as, I, as I appraise it right now, the risk is people being almost too open-minded, too doubting. But I, 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 no, but I, didn't, I didn't say that. Uh, I, I'm saying there are still principles, but you have to question these things. You have to think about these things. And if you're not thinking about these things, then you're not growing. 
I mean, it's a constant process reevaluating your own ideas. And I think that the fundamentalist circle is just a comfort zone. It makes life easy when life isn't easy. And and by the way, if I think, if I disagree with you and I use your view of things on, you know, there's the fundamentals right and wrong, then you're just immoral or stupid, so why, sh why should we talk about this? How could we have a conversation if we both held that sort of, sort of view? Well, I think we, yeah, we agree on how we dialogue. But if you use the Mormon example... Compromise. Uh, if you use the Mormon example, yes, they do isolate themselves. They do only deal with other Mormons. But within that group, they, they're, they're very strong. They have a trust base, and they're growing. No, they're not. That is false. No, that's not true. No. I just read this from my own thought. I'm sorry. It, it is not true. Uh, all of the demographics show that the Mormon community gets some converts, but they're losing more of their kids than the people they're getting in. They have a zero growth rate. The census that have been done in various countries where they ask people what their religious beliefs are show no growth in those countries. Worse yet, all of those censuses show that the Mormon church in those countries claims a membership rate three times higher than what the census shows. And in fact, the Salt Lake Tribune did a whole very good story of, uh, a couple years ago on that whole thing, how there's, it's a myth that the Mormon church is growing. It is not growing at all. It has a very high birth rate. And what they're actually doing is they're losing their young people who tend to be educated, well-off people, and what they're getting are a lot of converts who tend to be older, less educated. Often, uh, these days, they're going after Hispanic immigrants. That's one of their big target groups now. They're getting bodies, but they're getting older people that they're swapping for younger people. I heard, I heard that debunking, so when I, I was giving my talk, 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 uh, that time I was wondering if I was here to be on a free state project, and said something about people going off. Free State Project is a little different than people going into their isolated communities where they're going to make war, to the war with the world. I think the flaw in the Free State Project is that most of the, most of the real oppressive policies are federal. And that that can't do very much about it. Um, and I think sometimes they've had a diff uh, difficulty in telling a conservative from a libertarian. Those would be my two flaws. Or, oh, yep. Uh, that's, I don't have problems with people setting up, particularly like what Michael Strong wants to do with uh, cities. The, but the purpose of those cities are not to isolate themselves from the world, but to be centers of trade and interaction with the world. It's a very different mindset than... For instance, the fundamentalist Mormon communities in northern Arizona and southern Utah, where they intentionally go into a community, take control of it, keep everyone out, and then use everything there to enforce their, their uh, morality on everyone in the community. All right, we got to go. Yep.